Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another action-packed episode of what I hope is your favorite TV show on Saturday. Well, whenever you're watching this. I hope it's your favorite. I hope you're tuning in. We've got a lot of stuff we cover every single week. And a reminder that we give every week is that... All of our archives are available. All of our shows, including this one, will be available on YouTube. YouTube.com slash Northstar Oasis. Um, right now, we are you know, we were in the middle of a series of videos that we're showing on uh, instructional videos on the Ten Commandments. Uh, it's put out by Dennis Prager uh, and his Prager University. It's, it's all free material. Uh, but we want to make sure that, you know, we, we understand how the Ten Commandments can help it foster an improved and harmonious society. And we're not p playing the Ten Commandments, uh, you know, each week, one commandment a week, uh, out of, you know, for a sense of religious duty. We're not even really looking at the religious arguments at all. We're looking at what do we need to do to stop the killing in the cities, to stop the mugging, stop the thievery. You know, what do we have to do to actually have a society where everybody gets along and is in harmony? And we believe that taking a closer examination of the Ten Commandments is a prudent thing to do right now in the 21st century. But we also usually make a, a countdown every week. And with this week's topic, I'm going to tie it in with Black Friday. Yes, that is true. Black Friday. We have 259 shopping days left until Christmas. And I know what it's like on Black Friday when all these people are going in to get all the deals. And sometimes they get a little bit too rowdy. So here's today's commandment. Thou sh or do not murder. Yeah, you see, Black Friday, murder, you know, uh, mugging, you know, things like that. Anyhow, here's Dennis Prager, Prager University. You would think that of all the Ten Commandments, the one that needs the least explaining is the sixth, because it seems so clear. It is the one that the King James Bible, the most widely used English translation of the Bible, translates as... Thou shalt not kill. Yet the truth is quite the opposite. This is probably the least well understood of the Ten Commandments. The reason is that the Hebrew original does not say do not kill, it says do not murder. Both Hebrew and English have two words for taking a life. One is kill, harag in Hebrew, and the other is murder, ratzach, in Hebrew. The difference between the two is enormous. Kill means, one, taking any life, whether of a human being or an animal. Two, taking a human life, deliberately or by accident. Three, taking a human life, legally or illegally, morally or immorally. On the other hand, Murder can only mean one thing, the illegal or immoral taking of a human life. That's why we say, I killed a mosquito, not I murdered a mosquito. And that's why we would say the worker was accidentally killed, not the worker was accidentally murdered. So why did the King James translation of the Bible use the word kill rather than murder? Because 400 years ago, when the translation was made, kill was synonymous with murder. As a result, some people don't realize that English has changed since 1610, and therefore think that the Ten Commandments prohibits all killing. But of course it doesn't. If the Ten Commandments forbade killing, we would all have to be vegetarians. Killing animals would be prohibited. And we would all have to be pacifists, since we could not kill even in self-defense. However, you don't have to know how the English language has evolved in order to understand that the Ten Commandments could not have prohibited all killing. The very same part of the Bible that contains the Ten Commandments, the five books of Moses, the Torah as it is known by Jews, commands the death penalty for murder, allows killing in war, prescribes animal sacrifice, and allows eating meat. 
A correct understanding of the commandment against murder is crucial because while virtually every modern translation correctly translates the commandment as do not murder, many people cite the King James translation to justify two positions that have no biblical basis, opposition to capital punishment and pacifism. Regarding capital punishment and the Bible, the only law that appears in each one of the five books of Moses is that murderers be put to death. Opponents of the death penalty are free to hold the view that all murderers should be allowed to live, but they are not free to cite the Bible to support their view. Yet many do, and they always cite the commandment, do not kill. But that, as should now be abundantly clear, is not what the commandment says, and it is therefore an invalid argument. As regards pacifism, the belief that it is always wrong to kill a human being, again, anyone is free to hold this position, as immoral as it may be, and what other word than immoral can one use to describe forbidding the killing of someone who was in the process of murdering innocent men, women, and children in, let's say, a movie theater or a school? But it is dishonest to cite the commandment against murder to justify pacifism. There is moral killing, most obviously when done in self-defense against an aggressor, and there is immoral killing. And the word for that is murder. The Ten Commandments are portrayed on two tablets. The Five Commandments on the second tablet all concern our treatment of fellow human beings. The first one on that list? is do not murder. Why? Because murder is the worst act a person can commit. The other four commandments prohibiting stealing, adultery, giving false testimony, and coveting are all serious offenses. But murder leads the list because deliberately taking the life of an innocent person is the most terrible thing we can do. The next time you hear someone cite do not kill, when quoting the Sixth Commandment, gently but firmly explain that it actually says, do not murder. I'm Dennis Prager. And there you have it. Do not murder. Dennis Prager, I, I have to admire the man's scholarship. He knows his stuff and it all makes sense. And so I really hope that uh, for viewers like you that you can pick up something a little bit each week. Um, speaking of the difference between thou shall not kill and thou shall not murder, uh, we actually had an explosion occur. Uh, we haven't covered any train derailments, train explosions for quite a while. That was a staple of our show last year. Uh, part of that, I think, is also because we have, we, you know, the, as the prices of oil have dropped and the commodities market has dropped, uh, Things are kind of drying up as far as economic activity in North Dakota, so we're not bringing through as many hazardous oil trains through Minnesota as we used to. And I still firmly believe that we do need a pipeline uh, for when economic activity resumes, because inevitably it will. But there was a massive blast last month in northern Minnesota. Let's take a look at the news and take a look at this. Jeez, explosion. A camera from Fargo, North Dakota TV station WDAY catches a massive explosion from the site of a freight train that collided with a propane truck and derailed in northwestern Minnesota on Thursday. Authorities had said the truck caught fire at the time of the crash and that the propane was being vented and burned off. None of the cars affected by the crash was carrying hazardous materials and none caught fire. Canadian Pacific says the crash derailed seven empty cars and the locomotive of the 82-car train. The town of Callaway was evacuated. 230 people live there. The earliest they could return is noon Friday. I, I was scared the whole ride here and worried and I'm just glad my family's okay. The law enforcement, are do, they're doing a good job. Two workers were hurt when the train derailed. Officials say their injuries are not life-threatening. Sandy Kozell, the Associated Press. Well, one of the interesting things that occurred in that particular 
uh, incident, and I'm actually trying to pull up a story on it real quick here. Uh, I'm normally better prepared than this. Uh, hold on. That would be on the next page. Sorry about this. Um, the fire department had actually used a drone. I'm scrolling, scrolling. And of course it's way down and I can't find it. So I don't think I'm gonna worry about that. I'm just gonna go off the top of my memory here. Uh, the fire department in, uh, in, in responding to this incident actually used a drone. Uh, well, they sent this up and they hovered it over the, the train derailment to see which cars were leaking, which cars were burning, and that enabled the fire departments to respond in a proper and forthright manner and secure their safety. And this is one of the first times in, in, uh, as drone technology has been increasing, this has been one of the most interesting cases of how they're using the new technology to combat uh, uh, fire. And there was actually a meeting with Senator Amy Klobuchar. Uh, and the one thing that I will have to give the Senator credit for is that she is uh, talking about actually introducing legislation in Washington that would allow fire and police departments to use drones and get the FAA approvals uh, in the case of emergencies. And I think that would be a very big, huge landmark in uh, legislation that's actually needed for the safety community. So my hat's off to Senator Klobuchar for uh, putting that together, if indeed she actually does what she has hinted that she would be doing. So that was the, one of the reasons I wanted to bring you that story. But we're going to turn the page from trains into, well, kind of closely related, uh, fossil fuels. Uh, first of all, we uh, have 40 more weeks before President Obama is out of office and a new president will be inaugurated. And things are heating up on the campaign trail. But we're going to take a quick look right now at the delegate count. Uh, on the Republican side, 1,237 delegates are needed to secure the nomination. Donald Trump has 743. Ted Cruz has 532, John Kasich has 143, and there are 867 delegates left uh, between now and June 6th. Hillary Clinton leads uh, 1286 to Bernie Sanders 1034. I am not including superdelegates in this number because superdelegates can flip back and forth as many times as they want until they actually have to vote at the convention in July. So I'm keeping that out. 2,383 delegates are needed for the nomination. 1,942 are still available. And you know we're dealing with a 150 vote margin uh, taking away the Democrat superdelegates. And that's where we stand right now. Uh, well, let's take a look at something that happened with Hillary Clinton last week. And this comes from a Greenpeace activist who had accosted the former Secretary of State to, uh, regarding uh, receiving funding from the oil and gas industry. Let's take a look. Hillary Clinton is uh, tired of the Bernie uh, Sanders camp's lies, she says. In fact, here, let me show you. This is when she had a run-in with a Greenpeace activist about her donors in the fossil fuel industry. And then I'm going to have the facts for you. Let's watch. Sick of them lying about me. First of all, she's not with the Sanders campaign. Our Jordan Charton interviewed her on TYT Politics. She works for Greenpeace, not for Sanders. And Greenpeace is trying to get all the candidates to stop taking fossil fuel money. And she does take fossil fuel money, but I'm going to show that to you in a second. Uh, first, I want to show you one more um, Hillary Clinton interview on air talking about the same issue. 
When uh, people make these kinds of uh, claims, which now I think have been debunked, mm -hmm. uh, actually the Washington Post said three Pinocchios, the New York Times also analyzed it and other independent analysts have said uh, that they are misrepresenting my record. Uh, I'm just not going to, I feel sorry sometimes for the young people who, you know, believe that this, do their own research, and uh, I'm glad that we now can point to uh, reliable independent analysis to say, no, it's just not true. Oh, she feels sorry for you guys. <laughs> you don't know anything, <laughs> you young people. <laughs> You're fools. Why won't you vote for me? I don't understand. <laughs> Perhaps something to do with your condescension? So let's go to the actual facts. She says that, oh no, it's debunked. Okay, great. I'll go to the source itself that quote unquote debunked the story, Washington Post. She talked about it there, okay? So uh, they explain, according to the Center for Responsive Politics, as of March 21st, the Clinton campaign has received nearly $308,000 from individuals in the oil and gas industry. Mm, that doesn't look too debunked. In fact, they explain later it's actually $333,000 when you take it uh, all into account. Now, that is directly people who work for the oil and gas companies uh, giving money uh, to Hillary Clinton's campaign. Now, it could be that perfectly lovely people work there and, and they happen to give money to Hillary Clinton. For example, uh, Bernie Sanders also got $54,000 from people working at the oil and gas companies. Now, 54,000 is a hell of a lot less than 308,000, but we're at the tip of the iceberg here in the real money that was given to Hillary Clinton. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but it's one thing if uh, some random person, whether they're a clerk or an executive at an oil company, decides, hey, I like Bernie Sanders or I like Hillary Clinton and I'm doing this because I think it's the right thing for the country. It's another thing when lobbyists that work for those companies bundle money for you. See, that's a coordinated effort. Okay, so now uh, let's go uh, to those larger numbers. This is again the Washington Post. Uh, Greenpeace tracked nearly $1.5 million in bundled and direct donations from lobbyists currently registered as lobbying for the fossil fuel industry. Okay, well, that sounds like a lot of money, but we're not done yet. Then another $3.25 million in donations were directed by uh, such lobbyists to Priorities USA, a super PAC back in Clinton. Greenpeace claimed. Then they go on to explain, yeah, that's that's right. Where's the debunked part? Well, I'm going to get to that, and this is hilarious. Despite the fact that they say, yes, those numbers are correct, they gave it three Pinocchios. Three out of four. Three out of four, me, 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 saying mainly this is a lie. Bernie Sanders is a liar. Even though the facts are absolutely right. And they concede the facts. So why? Now, keep in mind, Washington Post, which she called neutral, has already written op-ed after op-ed, scathing attacks against Bernie Sanders. He's unrealistic, he's a socialist, he's no good for the country, etc. I mean, literally the most scathing op-eds in the entire country. Worse than the Wall Street Journal's op-eds, okay? So that's the Washington Post. So they go, okay, the facts are accurate. Now, let me tell you why I don't like Bernie Sanders. So now here's the rest of their analysis. Quote, we should note that under the law, Clinton cannot coordinate with the super PAC, so she has no control over these donations. <laughs> That's your astute political analysis, that these politicians are not coordinating with the super PACs. Oh, that super PAC that's spending tens of millions of dollars on my behalf? <laughs> well, golly gee, this is the first I heard of it. Really? That's your political analysis, Washington Post? Because they are the establishment. Like, I don't see any corruption. They collected four and a half million dollars on her behalf. I don't, no, they're probably not coordinating. Probably not coordinating. That is preposterous. It's embarrassing if that's what you really think is going on in American politics. Well, the American people don't agree with that. Okay, so now wait, they've got more excuses. Um, so they explain. So that adds up to the, all the donations to Hillary Clinton, up to more than four point five million dollars. So they acknowledge it. They acknowledge it right there. Right. That's certainly a bigger number. Than the three hundred thirty-three thousand dollars. That's basically the money directly given to her campaign, but it's still only two percent of the total contributions received by Clinton and outside groups backing her. Now that's true, but think about that for a second. Their excuse for her is, "Yeah, I know she took four and a half million bucks from the oil guys, but she's taking so much more from the others. <laughs> the bribes that the oil and gas companies gave her are small compared to what the banks gave her." See, not guilty. Bernie Sanders is a liar. Okay, I'm just quoting here. Okay, you keep let's keep reading here. Here's another excuse. 
There's a further problem with this calculation. Greenpeace counts all the money raised or contributed by lobbyists as quote oil slash gas industry funds, but these lobbyists have many other clients besides the oil industry. Oh, I see. So since these lobbyists are, are trying to corrupt her and they're not giving it for their health, they're looking for a return on investment, that's why they're lobbyists, but they work for drug companies and oil companies and banks, so let's not count it as money from the oil companies. Hey, that's one way of looking at it, okay? So don't worry, guys. She's been corrupted by all the industries, not just oil and gas. In fact, they give an example. Ben Klein, one of the lobbyists highlighted in the Greenpeace report, also lobbies for American Airlines, Cigna, and Hearst, according to the lobbying disclosure database. So in theory, his contributions to the Clinton campaign could also be labeled as funds for airline, insurance, or media industry. Well, you're right, they've also bribed her. <laughs> now, that, oh, the Washington Post would be aghast at my suggestion that millions of dollars handed to a politician is a bribe. No, that's just charity out of the goodness of their heart. They don't expect anything in return. This is what they call political analysis at what has become the pathetic Washington Post. Really? This is your analysis of who's right and wrong on this issue? Okay, we're not done yet with the excuses. Just a couple more here. Quote, there's no evidence any of these actions were tied to campaign contributions. <laughs> now, by the way, that's after they list a number of votes, because the Bernie Sanders campaign listed it, so they had to put it in the uh, paper, of ways that she has voted with the oil and gas industry including the tar sands in Canada, when she, you know, in that case she's not voting, but she's uh, headed in that direction as the Secretary of State. Uh, she uh, uh, was in favor of approving it, and then you've got her votes in the Senate when she was a senator, and all that, she, but, uh, she seems to vote with oil and gas, that's okay, fine, fine. And, but she, and she got four and a half million dollars, that's absolutely true. But you can't, uh, no, she's a beloved, honorable, honorable politician in Washington. How dare you challenge her honor in this way? Of course those campaign contributions are not tied to the millions of dollars she got from that industry and all the other industries. <laughs> wow, wow. The lies have become so brazen. I mean, it's Orwellian. <laughs> this is in the midst of an article that has the temerity, the gall, to claim that Bernie Sanders is lying. So that is an interesting argument that is uh, made. But there's actually another argument that they didn't actually even touch on that we're going to highlight for just a minute on Hillary Clinton. And it's not just the fossil fuel industry, not just oil and gas. There's also an issue of uranium. Yes, this is, I believe the story was buried, uh, came out last summer. But when Hillary Rodham Clinton was Secretary of State. She uh, had, uh, well, when I say she, uh, really the Clinton Family Foundation ended up taking money from the leaders of the Canadian mining industry over uranium. And members of that group had built, financed, and they eventually sold off to the Russians a company that would become known as Uranium One. Uranium One. Beyond mines in Kazakhstan, some of the most lucrative in the world, you know, the sale gave the Russians control of one-fifth, again, one-fifth, 20% of all uranium production capacity in the United States. You know what uranium is used for? Nukes. Uranium is considered a strategic asset, and it has implications of national security because it is nuclear material. And that same deal had to be approved by a committee that was composed of representatives from a number of the United States government agencies. And among one of those agencies that had to sign off was the State Department. Who was heading that State Department at that time? Hillary Rodham Clinton. So as the Russians gradually assumed control of Uranium One, yeah, they had three separate transactions from 2009 to 2013. Uh, according to Canadian records. You know, a flow of cash made its way into the Clinton Family Foundation. Uranium One's chairman had used the uh, Family Foundation to make four donations that totaled 
$2.35 million. Uh, the contributions were not publicly disclosed by the Clintons, despite an agreement that Mrs. Clinton had struck with the Obama White House to publicly identify all donors. Other people with ties to the company made donations as well. And where is this material coming from? It is coming from the New York Times. Now let's take a look at this brief video, which accentuates what I just told you. Hillary Clinton. Michael, you, was, you've got, this is looking like the Clintons have designs of becoming the most corrupt family in American politics. I won't, I, I won't embrace that notion, uh, Lou. However, when I picked up the paper this morning, I was absolutely astonished. And, it's, and it wasn't in the Washington Times or some you know, arguably right-wing paper at the New York Times uh, broke the story. Apparently, it, it, ar it arose out of a Hoover Institution uh, report, but... Uh, it, well, then, it was it was it was it was devastating. And then yeah. we find out because the Canadian government requires reporting, mm -hmm. we find out the Secretary of State when she Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State from 2009 to 2012 over that period of time, the Russian takeover of a company, Uranium One, that uh, based in Toronto, that has control of a fifth of the United States uranium deposits. She signed off on. CFIS signed off on. This is an administration that just turned over a strategically critical operation to the Russian government operating a shell company. Yeah, I mean, there is so much to address there. I think one of the things that is really appalling to me is that she told the Obama White House, we're going to report our donors. We're going to report our corporate donors. With this one that was happening at a very sensitive time where she right. was a decision maker, she didn't report it. I want to know why that is, and maybe it's on her server. And perhaps the best thing that ever happened to Hillary Clinton and the worst thing was Bill Clinton. And that is something else that I think all Americans should really be concerned about. When you're selling away strategic assets for the United States, for our national security, to an enemy for your personal uh, wealth enhancement program that my friends i really believe is a criminal act that may be an act of treason if one could look at that legal definition uh, and yet here she is running for president with a hundred and fifty vote uh, lead in the nominations process uh, over bernie sanders and i want to remind you that with Democrat super uh, super delegates, it's all up to whoever they want to support. There is no input from you, and that's the way it goes. Anyhow, we are going to move on because uh, we're running, you know, really close on time. Again, we got a really really packed episode here, um, so we're going to go and take a close look at the petroleum industry. We're going to take a look at how a product is made from petroleum, that product being plastic. Because we actually had some interesting news that came out uh, a week ago uh, Friday uh, from Minneapolis that we're going to get to in just a moment. But we're going to set this up with how plastic is made. Let's take a look. Plastics are often thought of to have a synthetic, almost unreal quality about them. The bendy, pliable texture and the ability to be moulded and coloured into virtually anything you can think of would not be possible without the unique blend of materials that make up plastics. Plastics are derived from raw materials, including coal, natural gas, minerals, plants and most predominantly crude oil. Without getting too involved in the chemistry of how we make plastic, it's basically a byproduct of our day-to-day -day use of oil. Mainly we use the oil for petrols and, and gasoline and so on, whereas there are a lot of byproducts. Those byproducts are mixed with other chemicals. Through a molecular structure, we can develop plastics. Well, there's no one answer to what is plastic because there are so many different types of plastics, each with their own sort of properties. Plastic is, is a man-made uh, product uh, and it's basically um, a chains of carbon uh, and hydrogen. The carbon it can come off coal, from coal or... No, 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 no. Uh, go back. Or oil. The hydrogen uh, can come off natural gas 
uh, or water basically and they're po polymerized uh, in a reactor to form the polymer that uh, we, we use in our factories. If a manufacturer needed a plastic product that could be heat resistant and bendy, the right chemical polymers would need to be predetermined in advance, ensuring that the relevant properties would be included in the end product. A polymer is a long chain of linked molecules, typically derived from gases. The links in polymers contain the relevant characteristics of a plastic material. Our design engineers are very, work very closely with the polymer people and with the moulding people to try and find the best match of what polymer suits what price, suits what, which product. And the end consumer then picks up the, the final result. Before plastic can be manufactured into a usable product, it arrives at the factory in a raw, processed state after being treated with various chemicals and produced into a workable form, beads or pellets. The raw materials are produced into a pellet form like what we've got here, which makes it easy for us to, to process in our machinery. We actually receive the bead in its form that it has all the characteristics that's needed out of that bead. Plastics can be mass-produced into a wide range of shapes, sizes and textures at a relatively low cost. There are three main processes involved in the mass production of plastics. Injection moulding, blow moulding and extrusion. And that is how plastic is made. We're going to go over a little bit finer tune on the chemistry because they'd introduce some of it but now let's give the explanation and there's a, there's a, a reason I'm, I'm doing this because there, there's I'm leading you into something here. From toothbrushes to telephones, straws to spaceships, plastics are used in an enormous range of products and have been for the last 150 years. Though they can have very different properties, they're all synthetic materials called polymers, made in a similar way. The building blocks of polymers are small molecules called monomers, obtained from crude oil. The carbon atoms are joined by double bonds, but these can be broken to create single bonds, free to join other carbon atoms and form long chains called polymer molecules. This process is called polymerization, and the resulting polymers are the main components of plastics. Plastics often take their name from their component monomers. So ethene becomes polyethene, or polythene. Similarly, styrene becomes polystyrene, and propene becomes polypropene. The reason plastics have different properties isn't just because they're made from different monomers. It's also down to how their polymer chains are arranged and held together. Take high-density polythene, for example, with straight polythene chains packed closely together producing a high-density material. It's rigid, strong, and used to make plastic milk bottles. But branched polymers cannot pack so easily, so the density is low. And this lighter, flexible material makes plastic bags. The force of attraction between polymer molecules also has an effect. The stronger these intermolecular forces, the tougher the plastic is, and the higher its melting point. Polymer properties can be changed by adding certain ingredients. Cross-linking agents create strong covalent bonds between adjacent polymer chains making the material stiffer, stronger, and more heat resistant. Plasticizers, on the other hand, make the material bendier by getting in between the chains 
and weakening the forces of attraction between them. Synthetic polymers have only existed for about 150 years. But it's hard to imagine a world without these amazingly versatile materials. And so there you have it. Hillary Clinton has taken four and a half million dollars of uh, lobbyists and, uh, and other campaign funds from the oil and gas industry, yet plastics are a byproduct of the oil and gas industry and the refining process. And plastic has literally replaced the entire fabrication industry and it's become a really huge part of our economy. Minneapolis City Council, on the other hand, I believe, disagreed with that assessment. They banned plastic bags a week ago. Not only that, but they are also, if, and, and I know this does not reach into Minneapolis, but I know that the philosophies often spread to St. Paul. They have voted to ban plastic bags in grocery stores. They have also voted in a five cent per bag tax on paper bags. What they want you to do is bring your own bag. The thing is, you really don't want to mix your fruits and your, and your meats together because you're going to have contamination and disease. You don't want to have your, you know, your salmonella or any other type of, uh, I mean, there's so many different uh, foodborne illnesses. Foodborne illnesses can actually, um, you know, spread between the meats and the vegetables, and you don't want that. You don't want the produce to be close to the meats, especially if there's any residue inside your bag. Well, of course, what they're looking at specifically is taking your own fabric bag, uh, even if they're, you know, there's artificial fabrics that have plastic components in them, they want you to bring your bag and put your meats and your fruit and your fruits and your vegetables all together in that same bag. But how many people actually go through and clean out those bags after they come down to the grocery store? You know what most people do that I'm aware of? They take the meats out, put it in the fridge or the freezer. They take the fruits and vegetables out, put them in the fridge, and then they put their reusable bag into whatever place it is that they have it until the next time they go and shop. Well, what happens? Bacteria builds up, mold builds up, and then you go back to the store and now you have contamination and you're putting in your fresh food. That's the unintended consequence in the action of the Minneapolis City Council. Let's take a look at the report on the Minneapolis City Council. The Minneapolis City Council just passed an ordinance that will change the way businesses bag customer purchases. It bans the use of plastic bags and charges a fee for paper bags. Ashley Roberts joins us live in downtown Minneapolis with more on this story. Ashley? Alley City Councilors Cam Gordon and Abdi Warsami first introduced this ordinance to reduce waste and litter in the city. After more than an hour of debating this issue and raising more questions than answers, it seemed as though council would postpone its decision, but the ordinance eventually passed. So here's what it means exactly. It means that plastic bags used to pack customers' purchases at checkouts will be banned in Minneapolis. Paper bags would also have restrictions. The paper would have to be made of recyclable material, and customers who choose paper paper bags would be charged at least a five cent fee. However, shoppers who take their own reusable bags to the grocery store would get at least a 10 cent credit. Council says plastic bags used for fast food, dry cleaning and newspapers would be a few of the exceptions under the ordinance. Go ahead and take a listen to some of the back and forth we heard before it passed. When we had our public hearing on this, almost everybody was in favor of this ordinance. They came in and spoke strongly in favor of it. If this ordinance were to pass, Thinking about just how much business we would force to go out of Minneapolis. A study in Austin, Texas states that one store lost over $60,000 per week. The ordinance is expected to start uh, next April. However, that could change. Several city departments have been asked to research ways to implement this ordinance and enforce it. They'll report their findings to council by January and then go from there. Ashley Roberts live for us in downtown Minneapolis. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, so Are let me get this straight. According to Cam Gordon, quote, we, when we had our public hearings, we had overwhelming support. 
how many people in opposition even knew of those public hearings or had the time to go to those public hearings. And you know what, those pro public hearings are probably held about the time that the mo most people would be shopping. And who did they invite to these public hearings? Only the people that support Cam Gordon? That's how a lot of these public hearings in government are held. We're going to bring in our people who support our position, but we're not going to let everybody else know because we don't want to hear opposition. So Cam Gordon's being a little disingenuous. I mean, he's probably factually correct that, oh, yeah, we had you know, overwhelming support for maybe 20 people. But uh, the other council member is right. You know, in Houston, there's, uh, they took a $60,000 a week loss when they imposed a ban down there. Now take a look. This is the city, the Minneapolis City Council. This is not Hennepin County, which means that if people are not going to want to have a, they're going to still want their plastic bags, they're going to go to other communities within Hennepin County. Now those places will do business until the Hennepin County Board decides to implement the Minneapolis uh, version of the ban. Or they'll come to St. Paul, which hasn't taken it up yet, uh, until, of course, the St. Paul City Council takes up that ban. And then it'll be the Ramsey County Board that'll, you know, the Ramsey County will benefit until the Ramsey County Board uh, you know, institutes the ban. But then you're going to have the all other outlying counties will be getting business from people. And if it's all banned in the metro area, you know what's going to happen? People will actually go to Wisconsin. If it's bad, if, if, if there's a statewide ban on plastic bags, it's going, the business will go to Wisconsin. That's just the way the economy works over this issue. And yet, I remember 25 years ago, it was this whole thing about we got to get rid of paper. There's too many trees that are, are, are being killed. We're, we're, we're killing too many trees. You need to use plastic because you, you, we're not going to kill the trees. So they made this big push for plastic. Now they're making this big push away from plastic, but they're making a push to penalize uh, paper. Yet there is actually a solution. But before that, we're going to actually take a look at this from a 3,000-foot perspective. Are you being told the truth about plastic bags? That's the first question. And here's your answer. Are you being told the truth about plastic bags? We all know we have to minimize and one day eliminate all of the plastic bags, and I think we can all agree on that. No, we don't all agree that we have to eliminate plastic bags. The London Times said in an editorial, Many of those who have demonized plastic bags have enlisted scientific study to their cause. By exaggerating a grain of truth into a larger falsehood, they spread misinformation and abuse the trust of their unwitting audiences. And David Lace to the Federal Marine Mammal Commission has said, In their eagerness to make their case, some of the environmental groups make up claims that are really not supportable. Plastic bags pose a huge environmental threat to our marine environment, 100,000 marine deaths per year due to plastic bags. This figure is based on a misinterpretation of a 1987 Canadian study, which found that between 1981 and 1984, more than 100,000 marine mammals, including birds, were killed by discarded fishing nets. The Canadian study did not mention plastic bags. Regardless, the erroneous claim has become the keystone of a widening campaign to demonize plastic bags. We have a global environmental crisis. Uh, you've heard the numbers on a million seabirds, 100,000 marine mammals annually. David Santillo, Greenpeace marine biologist, has said, It's very unlikely that many animals are killed by plastic bags. The evidence shows just the opposite. And David Laced of the Federal Marine Mammal Commission has said, the impact of bags on whales, dolphins, porpoises, and seals ranges from nil for most species to very minor for perhaps a few species. For birds, plastic bags are not a problem either. There are plastic patches now in our oceans, which are twice the size of Texas. The idea of a single Texas-sized garbage patch is the myth of media sensationalism. Dr. Marcus Erickson. Ocean Explorer and Director of Project Development at the Algalita Marine Research Foundation. The garbage patch is a veritable plastic oasis where millions of tons of plastic garbage remain trapped by the currents. It is said to be twice the size of Texas. Look at the video image carefully. 
Heal the Bay shows a giant plastic bag about the size of the entire United States, with small plastic bags behind it. They are suggesting that there's a giant island of plastic bags. But the National Science Foundation sponsored an expedition to the Pacific Ocean to search for marine debris. Most of the plastic items and particles collected were hard plastic. No large accumulations of plastic bags were found. Even Heal the Bay now admits that this claim is misleading. I would agree that the characterization, um, the term, the garbage patch, is um, you know, misleading in some, in some respects. There isn't a landfill out in the middle of the ocean. But Heal the Bay continues to make other unsupportable claims about plastic in the ocean. One of the researchers that, you know, has done a lot of work in this area, um, he, he said, you know, it's sort of like a soup of plastic. Um, or think of, you know, a football field that has um, degraded plastic confetti that's, you know, spread across it. Is it like a football field with plastic confetti spread across it? Angelique White, assistant professor of oceanography at Oregon State University, a National Science Foundation Pacific Expedition member has said, If we were to filter the surface area of the ocean equivalent to a football field in waters having the highest concentration of plastic ever recorded, the amount of plastic recovered would not even extend to the one-inch line. And Karen Lavender, oceanographer at the Sea Education Association, has said, If scientists sifted through 2,000 bathtubs worth of plastic-contaminated seawater, they'd find just enough microparticles to fill the palm of a person's hand. You know, my daughter uh, did a science project uh, about uh, six months ago, and she, remind, she told me there's this thing called the Great Pacific uh, Patch. Unfortunately, misinformed politicians are banning plastic bags based on myths. We realize how significant of a problem plastic bags are on the litter stream. It represents approximately 20% of the litter stream. Los Angeles has not done a litter audit. However, litter audits have been done in other places, showing that plastic retail bags are only about half of 1% of litter. The state of California alone, Caltrans and other entities, state beaches, pay over $25 million a year just to clean up the litter associated with plastic bags. Public agencies in California spend $375 million each year for all litter prevention, cleanup, and disposal. About half of 1% of all litter is plastic retail bags. Half of 1% of 375 million is 1.9 million, not 25 million. That means it costs each person no more than five cents each year for all plastic bag cleanup throughout the state. There's about $16 million or so a year spent on uh, litter removal, and it, it's, I think, safe to assume, wouldn't it be, Enrique, that five or six million, maybe more of that, could be attributable to plastic bags directly. <laughs> Half of 1% of $16 million is $80,000, not five or six million dollars. $80,000 is just two cents for each LA City resident per year. Think how much it would mean to this city to have an extra five million dollars that we don't have to spend cleaning up bags. In fact, not one penny of litter cleanup cost is saved by eliminating plastic bags. The same streets, highways, and other areas still have to be cleared of all other types of litter. So. Are you being told the truth about plastic bags? Obviously not. So, there you have it. Here's the reason why I wanted to play that. Because we see what's happening in Minneapolis with the plastic bag ban. You know that that issue is going to be brought up in St. Paul. That issue is going to be brought up in Ramsey County. We're going to be having to deal with it right here in our own viewing, in our own viewing area. And you're going to hear the same myths that were repeated on here in, in L.A. and other communities. They're going to be used here. And yet, the facts are different than their disingenuous arguments. So that's the reason I want to play this. We're going to be coming back to this topic, uh, you know, more in the future. But here's the thing. Reduce, reuse, recycle. That does not reduce. Does not mean government has to force you to not be able to use it because we have deemed that we know better for you than what you know. No, that's not the definition of reuse. 
uh, I mean, reduce. Reuse. Hey, I reuse my plastic bags. I do. You know, and my cat actually thanks Cub Foods uh, because I pick up the cat food in a uh, plastic bag. And guess what? I also dump out the litter in that same plastic bag. And I reuse it. There's also recycle. Plastic can be recycled. And keep in mind, with the petroleum products and the petroleum industry, the polymers and monomers that create plastic, they would be put into a landfill anyway. So we're making something useful that has been, that's used time and time and time again and can be recycled right back into oil or other plastic. You know, you saw the, the plastic beads. That's what happens with recycling. They can get put right back into the plastic beads to be used to make more plastic. Makes sense to me, but now what government should be doing is incentivizing that. That's really what government should do. But instead, we're going to take the opposite approach, which is going to give us the law of unintended consequences, when they could really say, hey, what we really need to do is put a plastic to oil factory in Minneapolis, and let's create some jobs in the process. But no, now they're going to penalize people, many low-income people, and then that kind of stuff is going to be spread right on over here into St. Paul. So when I mentioned plastics to fuel, what? Plastic can be made back into fuel, back into oil? So plastic came out of oil, but yes, it can be turned right back into oil. So let's take a look at that process right now. Today, we're recycling more plastics than ever before. Recycling can turn these valuable resources into new products, such as car bumpers, fleece jackets, plastic lumber for your backyard deck, and protective packaging. But some plastics cannot be recycled economically today. Is there a better option than burying these resources in landfills? One promising alternative is converting plastics to fuels. Just like it sounds, these technologies convert used, non-recycled plastics into oil, fuels, and other petroleum-based products. The process is fairly simple. Plastics that are not currently being recycled are heated without oxygen, using a process called pyrolysis to convert plastics into a gas state. These gases are then cooled and can be condensed into different products. Crude oil that can be refined into fuels and the feedstocks for other products, including plastics. Transportation fuels to power cars, buses, ships and planes. Petroleum products such as petrochemicals and lubricants that can be used in manufacturing and other industries. And fuel oils to produce electricity. Because plastics to fuels technologies could provide us with the ability to divert valuable materials from landfills and create an abundant source of alternative energy, the economic and environmental benefits of this technology are striking. If current capacity were to be expanded so that the U.S. could convert all its non-recycled plastics into oil each year, we could produce 5.7 billion gallons of transportation fuel annually, enough to power nearly 9 million cars per year. Additionally, the U.S. could support up to 600 plastics to fuels facilities, which could generate nearly 39,000 jobs and up to $9 billion in economic output. Plus, these technologies could reduce greenhouse gas emissions by up to 70% when compared to traditional forms of crude oil extraction. But the companies that process plastics into oils and fuels are encountering a stumbling block to achieving these benefits. Unfortunately, the existing legal frameworks in some states do not account for these technologies and incorrectly treat these technologies like regular waste disposal. The result? Communities continue to bury valuable resources in landfills. Policymakers can remove this stumbling block by updating regulations and permitting processes to reflect 21st century technologies by treating plastics to fuels equally with renewable energy technologies and by recognizing plastics to fuels technologies for what they are. A complement to community recycling programs, a domestic source of alternative energy and a boost for American jobs, and a manufacturing process that uses resources that would otherwise go to landfill to create valuable products in communities all across the country. It's time to stop burying valuable resources and embrace technologies that are good for the environment and good for America. Now doesn't that make a lot of sense? 
And hey, to go back to my whole cat analogy, so I pick up the cat food. I bring it home in a plastic bag. I reuse the plastic bag for the cat litter, for cat litter disposal, and everything's fine, right? What's going to happen if I have to bring my own fiber uh, bag to pick up the cat food? I have to stop and pick up garbage bags so I can do the litter. Most people I know, they use plastic bags for so many different reasons. And see, we can convert that back into oil. That makes perfect sense. And that is what we should be doing if we want to care about the environment, we want to protect the environment, we want to grow jobs. We want, we want to reduce our landfill space. That's a perfect way of doing it because I'm sure that plastic takes up a great deal of the space that's currently utilized in landfill. Now let's take one look at one more video on how to turn one man's trash into another man's oil. This may look like a landfill, but for some, it's an energy gold mine. New technology about to debut in the United States now has the power to take the waste plastic piled up here and transform it into oil. Since plastic, uh, at least the backbone for plastic, comes from crude oil, we can uh, unzip it and kind of cut it up into small pieces and turn it back into the crude oil from whence it came. To accomplish this, the company, Agilix, uses a process called pyrolysis. Dirty mixed plastics separated from the trash are ground to a pulp, packed into a giant steel cartridge and dropped into this machine. There, it is cooked into a gas at 800 degrees Fahrenheit, cooled and condensed into synthetic crude oil. For every one unit of energy put into the process, they get five units out. The small amount of toxic gas made from the process is treated by an environmental control device and burned off. The potential for the process is enormous. Less than 15% of the plastic generated in the United States is reused, leaving some 29 million tons to be buried in landfills each year. Because the recycling facilities currently don't have a way to separate those materials out into their different types of plastic. So that's why it comes to the landfill, because there's really not, it's not economical to separate it out, or the markets are marginal. One machine like this can turn 10 tons of plastic into 60 barrels of oil every day. Enough of them could put a dent in America's dependency on foreign oil. We've got a solution that not only solves a particularly difficult and thorny waste problem, that is mixed waste plastics, uh, but a, a, a solution that gives us a new source, uh, an alternative source, and a drop-in replacement for fossil crude. This new oil doesn't come cheap, but, Ullum says, so long as the price of oil stays above $80 a barrel, it can compete. Since its invention, some two to two and a half trillion pounds of plastic are estimated to have been buried in the United States, meaning today's trash dumps could be tomorrow's coal mines. So if we want to reduce our dependence on foreign oil, we want to reduce our dependence on new sources of oil, we want to reduce landfill space, the answer is not banning plastic bags, the answer is putting together plastic to oil refineries. That's really what makes the most sense. And you know what, two weeks ago we had highlighted chopsticks in the IR, IRRB and Rudy Purpose's old chopstick factory, but we've shown you how much is being wasted with chopsticks in, um, in overseas. Well, here's another thing that's happening. We can do more right here. But that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. North Star Oasis, we'll see you next week. Ladies and gentlemen, the 56 state and territorial flags of the United States carried by your United States Navy Ceremonial Guard.